This is lecture two, part two uh, of defining the terms women, power, and leadership. Are you feeling powerful today? Feeling not so powerful, but you want to be more so? Well, today we're going to redefine power so we can embrace it in order to lead with intention and without limits. Later in this course, you'll review and then use the No Excuses Power Tools to work on a problem or goal for yourself and to give and get feedback from others. Where the hell are all the women? Well, you've seen in the last lecture that women are stuck at 18% more or less of the top leadership positions across all sectors of work, politics, and uh, it doesn't matter what the discipline is. I wrote this particular article, and this is from Elle magazine. The, the title of the article is Where the Hell Are All the Women? And it was written at a time in 2008 when it seemed like we were going to have our first woman president. I was going to report on the dozens of organizations that spend millions of dollars training thousands of women to run for office every year. What I found is, much to my dismay, they had barely moved the dial for two decades. And at the rate women were increasing in public office, <clears throat> excuse me, it would take 70 years to reach parity. Now, I've been an activist for women for four decades, and I'd like to live another 70 years, but it's not likely. So I decided I had better do something to speed the process. I began to ask why. Why is it that despite the doors being open, despite voters trusting women more than men in politics, and women now being as able to raise money as men, the pattern continued? Now, there's been a small uptick this year, but just a few percentage points. So then I discovered that the dynamics were exactly the same at work and in personal life, too, as far as that goes. In fact, Sheryl Sandberg, the chief operating officer of Facebook, speculates that it will be 500 years in the corporate world before women reach parity. We have seen a woman first almost everything, but still... Still, though the power is in our hands we aren't always taking advantage of it. Now, the big consulting companies like Ernst & Young and McKinsey have studied corporations in the U.S., and they have found that those that have more women in their upper leadership and on their boards of directors actually make more money. The World Bank has studied parliaments all around the world, and they have found that the more women there are in the parliaments, the better the decisions are, and the better the decision-making process is to get there. So we learned last week about all the different ways women hold power in our hands, just like Catherine Bigelow here, the first woman to receive an Academy Award for directing, and then she won one for, for Best Picture. But women like Catherine Bigelow with Oscars in both hands don't always really know what to do with them. Our relationship with power is so intense, it's almost a spiritual thing. And until we learn how to embrace it with a whole heart, we women will stay stuck in what is really a half-finished revolution. And that matters for two reasons. We can, it allows us to blame other people and to excuse our lack of progress. But more importantly, it would let this amazing moment escape and keep us from leading the unlimited lives of which we're capable. So the, the point is that power unused is power useless. If we hold those Oscars in our hands, but we don't do something to help other women receive Oscars in the future, we aren't going to win. If we hold those Oscars in our hands and we don't do something with them in a positive way to keep advancing women and to, uh, to make things happen the way we think they ought to happen, to lead and live the way we think it should be, then that power is unused and therefore perfectly useless. And if we don't want others to have power over us in ways that are harmful, <clears throat> we have to claim our power and define what is good about power, the power to create positive change. Now, nobody's born knowing that, least of all me. Now, you may be thinking I'm pretty smart about all this, but let me tell you, um, this is a picture of me at age 16 with my oldest child. I, that's probably when I felt the most powerless I, and it was when I was in labor with, with my first child. And 
I had no family there. I was completely alone in a cold hospital room. The husbands at that time were not allowed in with you when you were in labor and delivery. I didn't really understand what was going on, what would happen with my body, and I just felt like I was non-existent. Existent. My experience as a teen mother then deeply shaped my understanding of women's power. I think that in every relationship, there are two relationships. There's the one that works and the one that doesn't. And in a sense, there were two versions of me. There was the part of me that was doing what I thought the culture wanted of me. I, I loved my children very much, and so I wanted to be the perfect wife and mother. But there was also the part of me that had no way to set boundaries or to take care of myself and that knew I had made some pretty bad choices and I was floundering. So you might want to think for a moment about your own life and when did you feel the most powerless? Because it's important for us to get in touch with those feelings as well as the times when we feel powerful so that we can emphasize the positive and, and not be focusing on the negative so much. Now, my father really tried. That's, that's him on the left. And he would tell me that I could do anything my pretty little head desired. But how could I hear him when my mother's behavior told me that women had little power to determine their fates? And then, of course, my father moved us to this tiny little dying West Texas town, much like the picture you see here in the movie poster of the last picture show. And the, the cultural expectations for women were limited to early marriage, babies, and taking care of the house. I'd like to think that this is no longer the case, but honestly, for many of the self-introductions that I have read, it seems like there's still a lot of that going around. And I really tried to be the perfect wife and mother. I thought I did what I was supposed to do, and it was kind of what I had talked myself into wanting. But at some point, we have to ask, am I able to say there's another way? As Audre Lorde says, if I didn't define myself for myself, I would be crunched into other people's fantasies for me and eaten alive. So I started to college when my youngest child of three was four months old, and it took me 12 years to finish. And the good thing is that along the way, I had time for a number of epiphanies. One of them happened to me when I was working in some organizations supporting the civil rights movement. And I found out about this woman, Sojourner Truth. Sojourner Truth was born a slave. I doubt that anybody could have been born with less power than she had. To be a slave and a woman was a double whammy, believe me. She gave birth to 13 children, of whom five, I think, lived to adulthood, and several of those were sold into slavery in other plantations, so she probably didn't ever see them again. But Sojourner Truth ultimately became, and by the way, she, she says she didn't, she didn't run away from her master. She walked away. She just got up and walked away one day and said, I'm not doing this anymore. And she ultimately became a Methodist minister, a leading abolitionist, and a leading women's rights advocate. Very well known. And in fact, she was arrested in her 70s or 80s for trying to vote in the Washington, D.C. area. So Sojourner Truth inspired me, and looking back at that time, I, I can see that, you know, in some ways I needed to learn stories like that because I was using powerlessness as an excuse to defer action myself. I think I was afraid of assuming responsibility for my own decisions about life's big questions, but ultimately I had to learn that I was the real unanswered question. And I had to decide whether I was ready to become a woman on my own, fully responsible for my fate and the consequences of my choices. And I learned that we grow our courage muscles to break old patterns, just like we grow our physical muscles when we exercise them. The resources we need are, in fact, almost always there if we're open to seeing them and wise enough, courageous enough to actually use them. 
So it was a long journey, and I'm going to fast forward through it. Uh, you're welcome to ask questions, but um, but but really quickly here, I, I had a wonderful 30 years as the CEO first of Planned Parenthood in West Texas, then of Planned Parenthood in Arizona, and then of the national organization. And in each of those situations, I had a chance to grow the organization significantly. I had so many amazing experiences. Gosh, like getting birth control routinely covered by insurance plans, uh, turning the movement mindset around from defensive to proactive, at least for a brief shining moment and getting to lead the whole organization through a 25-year visioning process that revitalized it. I, I had found a career leading a cause, just like I was leading the March on, March on Washington, the March for Women's Lives in 2004, the one that brought the most people that has, has ever been brought to Washington for a protest march, by the way, about a million and two or 300,000 people. Uh, you didn't, wouldn't have known that from the media coverage, but it is, in fact, true. So it was all great, but what happened is that I had put 150% of myself into it. And in the process, I gave away my power in many ways, just as I had done when I believed as a teenager that the locus of power was outside myself in a culture that told me how to shape my body and my aspirations. I let the movement consume me. I spoke in its voice, and I lost track of who I was. And that's a very real danger for those of you who take on a profession that is so emotionally uh, important to you. Um, I tell you that because there are many ways to relinquish our power, and, and that's one that might come as a bit of a surprise to you. So though I had a chance to do extraordinary things, and to be in the highest halls of power, as well as to build a, an organization from the grassroots up, I truthfully wasn't there yet with my own relationship with power. And so then after I left Planned Parenthood, the good news is that life is, there's always another chance in life. And, and that's a really good thing because I blew my next chance too. Um, the cover of this book is... Uh, is the one that the first one that I wrote after I left Planned Parenthood called Send Yourself Roses, which I wrote with the actress Kathleen Turner. And I love her. She's fabulous. We're, we're great friends. And we were equal partners in this project. But when we went to the publisher for the big publicity meeting, the publicist literally turned his back to me and spoke only to Kathleen. And honestly, it was in that moment that I finally had the necessary confrontation with myself. And I thought, you idiot, you've done it again. You're speaking in someone else's voice. Get a grip. You know, it's time for you to, to speak for yourself. And so at that point, I was, I was already a grandmother with, with many grandchildren and uh, at an age when many people are starting to retire. But I was finally learning to embrace my own power. Several of you have commented that you really like the baby elephant story that I tell in No Excuses. And the thing is, I was still thinking like a baby elephant you might want to think for yourself and maybe jot down some notes for yourself. What baby elephant thinking do you have in your head that's keeping you from claiming your power? And sometimes it's not just baby elephant thinking, but this is my friend Brooke Axtell. She's a, an author and an activist. And she, sometimes that self-limitation comes from very deep trauma and pain. She, uh, Brooke was sexually assaulted brutally and repeatedly as a child. In her poetry, though, she explores her own journey to defining her terms, claiming her power, and using her authentic voice. And those are just some of the uh, very real hardships and journeys that we have to, to recognize and that, that some of you have told in your own stories and that coming through it has, has given you a sense of your own power along the way. What doesn't kill us makes us stronger, as they say. Now, these traumas, cultural discrimination, and cultural pressures are real. 